Imagine building the world's most luxurious car, only to watch it become a disaster and leave you stranded with a warehouse full of 25 unsold massive engines. Ettore Bugatti refused to admit defeat, so he put those race-bred monsters into a train, stripped away all safety, and forced the driver to ride exposed on the roof. It sounds like the ultimate act of desperation, or brilliance, or maybe both. But how did this wild gamble set up the deadliest showdown between ego and physics in rail history? France, in 1929, was a country where old money still believed in grandeur, and Ettore Bugatti was determined to outshine them all. He set out to build the Type 41 Royale, a car so large and so lavish that it was meant to be driven by kings and presidents. The Royale stretched over 6 meters long, and it was powered by a 12.7-liter straight-8 engine. Each engine block was a work of art, cast in a single piece, polished by hand, and designed to move a three-ton limousine as if it weighed nothing. Bugatti wore his pride like a uniform, dismissing customers he thought unworthy. The car cost more than a house, but the world changed overnight. The Great Depression hit, fortunes vanished, and the market for palatial automobiles simply evaporated. Between 1927 and 1933, only six Royales ever left the factory. Of those, just three found buyers. The rest sat unsold, gathering dust in Molsheim. Bugatti had invested in tooling and parts for at least 25 engines, each one an engineering marvel, now rendered useless by a world that no longer had any use for kings or their cars. The workshop, once alive with the hum of possibility, became a silent warehouse of stranded ambition. Every unsold engine was a weight pulling the company toward ruin. For a man who built his name on speed and style, the reality was brutal. The Royale was a masterpiece, but it was also a catastrophe. Ettore Bugatti needed a way out, and fast. French railways in the early 1930s were desperate for speed. Road traffic was eating into ticket sales, and the old steam locomotives just couldn't keep up. The government wanted something that could move people between Paris and the coast in hours, not half a day. Bugatti saw his moment. He didn't pitch another heavy locomotive. He promised a machine that would outpace cars by thinking like a car maker, not a railway engineer. For Bugatti, weight was the enemy. Every kilogram slowed you down, burned more fuel, and stressed the rails. His solution was radical build a train like a racing car. The structure would be as light as possible, steel frames, thin alloy panels, and no extra fat anywhere. No heavy axles, no thick armor, nothing that didn't make it go faster. The body was streamlined, not just for looks, but to slice through the air at speeds French rails had never seen. He walked into meetings at the Chemin de Fer de l'État and offered a new kind of express a rail car so light it could leap forward the moment the throttle opened. Forget coal and water tanks, he would use gasoline, the same fuel that powered his Grand Prix winners. The rail directors were skeptical, but they couldn't ignore the need for change. Other companies were already testing rubber-tired rail cars and diesel prototypes. Bugatti's promise was simple. Take these orphaned engines, give them a new home, and France would have the fastest express service in Europe. The contract was signed. The warehouse full of failed luxury became the blueprint for a silver bullet on rails. Bugatti's solution for the railways wasn't just bold, it was mechanical excess packed into a single streamlined shell. At the heart of the machine sat a cluster of engines that ignored every convention in railway design. Rather than the single lumbering boilers of steam tradition, Bugatti reached into his warehouse and pulled out the straight eight monsters he had built for the Royale. Each engine was a 12.7-liter work of art, cast in one piece, with a single overhead cam and three valves per cylinder. In the rail car, these engines were not just reused, they were multiplied. In the most extreme versions, four straight eight engines worked together in the center of the car, their combined output pushing toward 800 horsepower. This was not a train in the old sense, it was a power-dense bullet. The engine sat low and tight, packed so closely that the floor itself was sacrificed. Passengers rode in saloons at either end, but the core of the train was a mechanical jungle, 
banks of polished metal crisscrossed with shafts, gearboxes, and cooling ducts. Each engine drove its own axle through a mechanical transmission, sending power down to the wheels with a directness that felt more like a racing car than a locomotive. The sheer scale was intoxicating. Each block weighed as much as a small car, and together they made the car body vibrate with a deep, metallic vibration. The noise was relentless, four straight eight engines each firing in its own rhythm, filling the thin-walled shell with a constant barrage of sound and heat. There was no room for compromise. Every kilogram saved on structure meant more speed, and it also meant less space for anything that was not essential. By cramming so much power into such a small space, Bugatti created a new problem. There was simply nowhere to put a driver's cab. The engines claimed the center, the passengers took the ends, white, and the only place left for a human was above it all, perched on the roof. The machine's brilliance came at a cost, a spatial crisis that would define everything about how it was driven and how it felt to be at the controls. There was only one place left to put a human. The engines filled the center of the train, a dense, noisy block of metal that stole every inch of floor. The passengers sat at either end, sipping coffee in their armchairs, but the driver had to climb a narrow ladder fixed to the side. At the top, 12 feet above the rails, a glass bubble jutted from the roof, a cupola barely bigger than a phone booth. That was the cockpit. It was not a seat in the traditional sense. It was a lookout post surrounded by thin glass and a metal frame, perched where the wind was strongest and the danger was closest. From up there, the view was total. The driver could see the rails stretching out in both directions, the horizon shimmering through the heat haze, the countryside blurring past. The cupola gave 360 degrees of visibility, a full command of the line, but it also made the driver the most exposed person on the train. There was nothing between him and the world except a few millimeters of glass. If the train hit a low bridge, the first thing to go would be the cupola. If a stone flew up from the track, it would hit the driver before it hit the engine. In the event of a derailment, the cupola would be the crumple zone. Every sense was on high alert in that kiosk. The noise from the engines below was constant, a mechanical earthquake that shook the glass and made the controls vibrate in the driver's hands. The smell of gasoline drifted up from the vents. The wind hammered at the sides, trying to rip the little glass dome away. The driver's body became a weather vane, buffeted and battered, forced to anticipate every lurch and sway of the car below. The cupola was an engineering compromise, a necessity turned into a risk. It was the price of fitting so much power into so little space. In Bugatti's pursuit of speed and elegance, the human element became an afterthought, a single figure, isolated and exposed, riding above a machine that was always on the edge of control. The throttle opened wide. Four straight eight engines, each nearly as long as a man, roared beneath the floor. The entire car body trembled as the pistons hammered out 800 horsepower, their rhythms overlapping into a metallic storm. The thin shell of steel and alloy around you felt weightless, almost insubstantial, as if the engines themselves were dragging the train forward by sheer force of will. Wind howled over the roof, slamming into the glass cupola with every surge of speed. Below, the rails blurred into a flickering ribbon, jointed seams hammering up through the suspension in a relentless bone-jarring rhythm. There was no gentle glide, just the sensation of being hurled across the landscape. The vibrations traveled straight up the ladder, through the seat, into your spine. The countryside didn't pass by, it detonated in flashes. Trees, telegraph poles, villages would appear and vanish before you could blink. The world outside the dome twisted and flexed, the horizon rippling with heat and speed. Every bump in the track sent the whole car hunting from side to side, a light machine wrestling with rails meant for half the velocity. At 196 kilometers per hour, the air itself became an adversary. The cupola rattled, glass flexing in its frame, every gust threatening to rip it loose. The noise was overwhelming, a mix of engine thunder, wind shriek, and the staccato clatter of steel wheels over rail joints. You gripped the controls with white knuckles, every muscle tense, every sense stretched to the limit. There was no room for error. A misread signal, a straying animal, 
a loose bolt in the track could end it all in an instant. But in those moments, the Bugatti Autorail was the fastest thing on rails, a silver bullet that outran the world and left your nerves raw and exposed. Every second at the controls was a fight against the track itself. The Bugatti Autorail was light, far lighter than any steam engine, but the rails beneath it were old, jointed, hammered together with bolts and fish plates. At speed, the seams did not just sing, they punched. Each gap sent a shockwave up through the wheels, through the frame, and finally into the cupola where the driver took the full force. The sensation was not smooth motion, it was a relentless series of impacts, a metallic heartbeat that grew faster and harder as the train accelerated. The whole car began to sway, hunting from side to side, never quite settling. This was the physics of hunting. Oscillation, a dance that every rail engineer dreads. The lighter the car, the more it wanted to skip and wander. On jointed track, the effect was multiplied. The wheels would find a rhythm, left, right, left, right, until the entire shell vibrated like a tuning fork. At 150 kilometers per hour, the world outside blurred, but inside the cupola, the motion was anything but invisible. The seat bounced beneath you, your hands shook on the controls. The glass dome rattled so hard you could taste metal in the air. Every bump was a reminder that the auto rail was not designed for comfort. The suspension was stiff, meant to keep the body flat at speed, but it could not absorb the violence of the track. The driver's spine became the shock absorber. Shoulders ached from bracing against the sway and every muscle tense before the next jolt. The horizon wobbled, the rails flickered, and the only constant was the staccato hammering from below. Passengers at either end might have felt a thrill, but in the cupola, the thrill was laced with fear. The faster the train ran, the more it threatened to shake itself apart. The metal shrieked, the engines howled, and the driver's nerves frayed with every passing kilometer. This was not the glide of a luxury express. It was a violent negotiation with physics, a reminder that speed on old rails comes at a price. Stopping a Bugatti Autorail at speed was less an act of control than a contest with physics. The braking system was a direct descendant of automotive thinking. Mechanical drum brakes actuated by cables scaled up for a 30-ton train. On paper, it was simple. Four drums, one per powered axle, each meant to clamp down and convert motion into heat. But the numbers tell a different story. At 100 kilometers per hour, a 40,000 kilogram rail car carries over 15 million joules of kinetic energy, 10 times what a family car holds at the same speed. At 160 kilometers per hour, the energy quadruples. Every emergency stop meant pouring that energy into spinning metal, and the brakes had to absorb it all in seconds. The drums themselves were heavy cast iron, but even with hundreds of kilos of thermal mass, the heat load was brutal. A single hard stop from top speed could push the drum surface past 300 degrees Celsius. The lining, usually asbestos or an organic composite set, would start to fade as the friction coefficient dropped. With every repeated stop, the risk grew. Linings glazed, drums warped, and heat crept up the cable runs. There was no air reservoir to back you up. The driver's hand on the brake lever was the only thing standing between speed and disaster. Engineers could calculate the fade curves, and the numbers were unforgiving. The system could handle one emergency stop from 120 miles per hour, maybe two, but not a series. The brakes were always one panic away from boiling over. In a world where failure meant a runaway train, Bugatti's lightweight philosophy left no margin. The autorail was a machine built for speed, but when it came time to stop, it became a rolling experiment in the limits of friction and heat. Under the thin floor, tanks brimmed with gasoline, enough to feed four engines at full throttle for hours. This was not the thick, slow-burning coal of a steam locomotive or even the oily diesel that would later become standard. Gasoline vaporizes at room temperature, ignites with a single spark, and turns a rupture into a firestorm. The Bugatti Autorail carried hundreds of liters, more than 100 gallons, pressurized by the motion and heat of the engines, 
and stored in compartments with little more than sheet metal between fuel and flame. Every jolt on the jointed rails risked a leak. Every hard stop sent fuel sloshing against the tank walls. The smell drifted up through the vents, sharp and sweet, a constant reminder of what lay beneath. In a derailment, those tanks would shear open in an instant. The gasoline would spray out under the car, atomized by speed and impact, mixing with air in a cloud that could ignite from a single spark, like an exhaust manifold, a grinding wheel, or a stray wire. There were no firewalls, no automatic shutoffs, no armored tanks. The entire train was a rolling bomb, lighter than a bus, but carrying the explosive force of a small aircraft. The driver, perched above it all, understood that if the car left the rails at speed, there would be no time to react. The fire would reach the cupola before the brakes ever cooled. Every kilometer was a bet against fate, a wager made with gasoline and steel, on track never meant for this kind of speed. Today, high-speed trains move millions safely behind layers of engineering discipline. Yet every record, every innovation, starts with someone willing to ignore limits, sometimes recklessly. The line between genius and disaster is thin, and we still walk it with every leap in transport. Progress leaves its bruises and its warnings etched into the rails. Would you trust your life to the next wild idea? Let me know what you think below.